Number 9. Ruslan and Roman Glukoy Ruslan and Roman Glukoy emigrated to the US from Ukraine with their parents as young boys. The family settled in California, where the boys became star wrestlers as teens and even went on to compete in state championships. Unfortunately, the young athletes veered down a wrong path after a car accident in 2011 left them both addicted to prescription painkillers. Police records show that the brothers have criminal records dating back to 2012, when they were still minors. One day in 2014, Roman and Ruslan got into a high-speed police chase after they were seen committing a burglary. They crashed their vehicle on a highway exit, so they abandoned it and stole a truck. The pair continued to flee law enforcement, reaching speeds of up to 100 miles per hour, 161 kilometers per hour. They crashed the truck into a car during the early morning hours, killing 35-year-old Jose Luis Barriga Tovar and his 14-year-old daughter Anahi Tovar. Police charged the twins with two counts of murder each. Ruslan, who was behind the wheel, received two life sentences. Roman will spend 30 years to life behind bars. Number 8. Jazz and Taz Whitehead when mom Nikki Whitehead gave birth to twin daughters Jasmiah and Tasmiah in 1993 when she was just 17, she never could have imagined how horrifically things would end. Being a young mom, she wasn't a constant presence in their lives, so her family helped raise the beautiful, outgoing girls. Jazz and Taz lived with their great-grandmother while Nikki got her life together. She gained custody of her 13-year-old daughters in 2007, and they moved into the home she shared with her boyfriend in Conyers, Georgia. During their time at their great-grandmother's, the sisters had gone from being straight-A students to cutting class and dating older boys. Not wanting her daughters to become teen moms and experience the same troubles that she had, Nikki imposed strict rules. She and the girls clashed, and soon enough their fights turned physical. Jazz and Taz returned to their great-grandmothers until 2010, when a judge granted Nikki full custody. Just eight days after they moved back in, Nikki was found dead in her bathtub. She had been bludgeoned with a vase and brutally stabbed over 80 times. The house was covered in blood. Jazz and Taz tried pointing the blame at Nikki's boyfriend, Robert, who took a DNA test and was cleared as a suspect. Detectives noticed that the sisters didn't seem very upset about their mother's death. Soon enough, they were getting caught in lies. Their story clearly wasn't adding up, but there wasn't enough evidence to charge them in Nikki's death, so they returned to their great-grandmothers and lived as if nothing had happened. Months later, a mold of Nikki's teeth was matched to a bite mark on one of the girls. It was enough to charge them with murder. They both took plea deals in exchange for a 30-year sentence each. As a condition of their pleas, they had to confess to killing Nikki. Jazz and Taz revealed that they had been plotting to murder their mother for quite some time. They even kept a journal dedicated to how much they hated her and wanted her dead. Nikki only wanted the best for her daughters. She paid for it with her life when they got mad at her for telling them to get out of bed that morning and decided to carry out their sick plot to eliminate her from the picture. Number 7. Robert and Steven Spahalski Identical twins Robert and Steven Spahalski were born and raised in Elmira, New York. They were extremely close, sharing a bond that included a tendency towards deviance. The brothers were heavy partiers with a violent streak that ultimately led them both to commit murder. Unlike some twins, Robert and Stephen didn't co-conspire. When Stephen was 17, he bashed a store owner over the head with a hammer and then stabbed him to death. Robert was already in jail for a parole violation, marking the first of many overlapping sentences that the brothers served for crimes they committed separately. On New Year's Eve in 1990, Robert murdered a prostitute. He killed his girlfriend just months later. Then, he bludgeoned a male sex worker to death. Robert evaded suspicion for all three murders and went on to kill his friend Vivian Irizari in a crack-induced rage. Plagued by guilt over Vivian's murder, he walked into the police station just days later and calmly confessed to the crime, as well as the previous killings. In 2006, Robert received three sentences of 25 years to life. He's serving them consecutively and will never get out of prison. Stephen was released in 2009 and returned to a life of crime. Just six months later, he landed himself back in prison for holding up a bank. He was released again in 2016, and it remains to be seen whether the brothers will end up doing more time together. Number 6. Daniel and David DeWilde 
During the summer of 2003, a young mother named Heather DeWilde disappeared in Golden, Colorado. Her family immediately pointed the finger at her soon-to-be ex-husband, Daniel. The couple were just days away from finalizing their divorce, and the process had been nothing short of contentious. Heather was last seen alive at Dan's home. He told police that she had left their kids with him to go shopping. His story seemed suspicious, but police didn't have enough evidence to charge him in her disappearance. They continued to investigate, and in the meantime, Dan's twin brother David, who was also a suspect, moved in to help out with the bills. Heather's remains were found a month after she vanished. It was clear that she had been murdered, but detectives still couldn't link Daniel to the crime. The investigation continued to lag, and Heather's family began to wonder if she would ever get justice. It was clear to police that Daniel was more stubborn and controlling than David, so they focused on trying to get David to crack under pressure. It worked. He told investigators that Dan was sick of paying child support and had been plotting to kill Heather for some time. David admitted to being there when Daniel killed Heather and helping his twin brother to dispose of his estranged wife's remains. Daniel is serving a 74-year sentence, and David received 12 years. Number 5. Doris and Yvette Gay Twins Doris and Yvette Gay were born into poverty and sadly never managed to escape it. In 1990, when they were 27 years old, the identical twin sisters found themselves living in an abandoned bus in Washington, North Carolina. They shared the unheated, tiny living space with Yvette's two children, who were fathered by her married boyfriend, Rennick Gibbs. Rennick had spent several years bouncing back and forth between Yvette and his wife, Anne. Yvette became increasingly jealous of Anne and wanted Rennick to herself. He told Yvette that they could finally be together and get married if she cooperated with his plan to murder Anne and his in-laws. She agreed, and Doris watched her kids. Yvette and Rennick went to his in-laws' house, where Anne was living after recently leaving him. What Yvette didn't know was that Rennick didn't plan to murder Anne. He wanted to kill her parents, because he thought they were influencing her not to reconcile with him. Anne's mother, Louise, and her teenage brother and sister were the only ones home. The couple bound and gagged them, and Rennick mercilessly shot them dead, execution style. Police immediately suspected Rennick, who had trouble keeping his story straight from the beginning. It wasn't long before he confessed to the murders and implicated Yvette and Doris for their roles in the crime. Even though Doris stayed behind, prosecutors believed that she played an integral role in the plot. Yvette and Rennick received three death sentences, which were later commuted to life in prison, and Doris received three life sentences. Number 4. Jerome and Tyrone Page 15-year-old Amanda Lee Hall ran away from her home in Baltimore in 1993 after getting into a fight with her boyfriend. After staying with various friends, she sought refuge at a local recreation center where she slept in an outdoor area. It was there that she encountered twins Jerome and Tyrone Page, who were drinking and using cocaine. The brothers had long rap sheets and had both done time years earlier for watching a gang rape. Not surprisingly, Amanda turned up dead after crossing paths with the twins. Her body was found along an old road, and an autopsy determined that she had been raped and strangled to death. Because identical twins have the same exact DNA, detectives had a tough time determining what role each brother played in the crime. Jerome admitted to raping and sodomizing Amanda, and took the blame for the murder, even though prosecutors believed that Tyrone was the brother that actually killed her. He received a life sentence. Tyrone's defense lawyer argued that he was the more innocent and mild-mannered twin, and that Jerome had influenced him to participate in the crime. But the judge didn't buy the good versus evil twin argument, and also sentenced him to life. What do you think? Was one twin responsible, or both? Let us know your theories in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more chilling content. Number 3. Betty Wilson and Peggy Lowe Jack Wilson was an ophthalmologist and a well-liked community member who lived in Huntsville, Alabama. He arrived home one day in 1998 to an intruder in the house who beat him with a baseball bat and stabbed him to death. At first, locals assumed that Wilson was the victim of a burglary gone wrong. Police later traced the crime to a carpenter named James White, who lived 150 miles, 241 kilometers away. He told detectives that the doctor's wife, Betty Wilson, along with her twin sister, Peggy Lowe, had hired him to kill Jack. White received several thousand dollars to carry out the hit, but said that he wasn't in it for the money. 
He was in love with Peggy, who was married, and made a sarcastic comment one day about how he could arrange for something terrible to happen to her husband. Peggy allegedly responded by saying that her twin sister needed someone to kill Jack. Betty denied having anything to do with her husband's death, and said that the couple got along fine. Locals told a much different story, claiming that Betty was having numerous affairs. She supposedly even bragged about how smart she was for getting away with her double life, while Jack spoiled her courtesy of his six-figure salary. Peggy, on the other hand, received plenty of sympathy. Her church friends even raised money to pay her $150,000 bail. She denied having a romantic relationship with White. Her lawyer painted him out as crazy, citing his lengthy history of psychiatric hospitalizations. White and Betty received life sentences, and Peggy was acquitted. She claimed that both she and Betty were innocent, and that her sister was falsely convicted. Betty is still in prison, but continues to maintain her innocence as her loved ones fight to get her released. Number 2. Dante and Dante Hall In 2006, an erotic dancer named Angel Glenn was hired to dance at a house party in Eustis, Florida. While there, she called her boyfriend Dante Hall to tell him that there were valuables in the house and where to find them. Dante and his twin brother Dante showed up at the house with guns and shot out the lights. They continued firing bullets as partygoers got on the ground and began handing their jewelry over. Two men were shot dead, while numerous others were injured. After the robbery, Dante told Angel that he was upset about how the robbery went because he didn't get as many valuables as he thought he would. Days later, police caught Angel pawning some of the stolen jewelry and arrested her. She and another dancer who were at the party opened up about what happened and agreed to testify against the twin brothers. A jury convicted Dante for both murders, although many believed that Dante may have fired one of the fatal shots. Dante received a death penalty, but the sentence was thrown out and he is awaiting his resentencing. Dante is serving a life sentence. Number 1. The Borkham Twins One day in 1999, Deborah Borkham entered her twin son's bedroom and found an assault rifle under one of their bed covers. She confronted the 11-year-old boys, and one of them tried wrestling the rifle out of her hands, while the other twin pulled out a handgun and shot her in the arm. Their father, William, rushed upstairs to see what the commotion was about and received two bullets to the neck. The boy's 16-year-old sister, Robin, tried dialing 911 and was also shot. She collapsed outside in a porch swing. Deborah and Robin survived, but William died from his injuries. The scene was oddly calm when police arrived. One of the boys was outside feeding his rabbits, and the other was wandering around inside the house. Their nonchalant demeanor led some to speculate that the twins are sociopaths, and investigators initially said that they believed the boys were plotting to kill their family and that Deborah interrupted them right as they were about to carry out their plan. But when the case finished working its way through court, District Attorney David Waters told the Associated Press that they do not believe the twins meant to injure anyone before they turned the guns on their family. Under North Carolina law, they couldn't serve time past their 18th birthday, and their records would be wiped clean at that time. The boys were sentenced to six years in a juvenile detention facility. Their reasons for shooting their family remain a mystery. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to subscribe for more true crime and let me know what cases you would like to hear more about in the comments below.